morning, everyone, and welcome to OLA 2020. Thank you so much for joining us for Failing Forward, Turning Setbacks into Success. My name is Allison Hayes, and I am the incoming chair for the Public Library Division. I'm so happy to moderate this session, and I am joined by our session presenters. We have quite a few today, all from Western Plains, and we have Kathy Ashley, who is the Public Services Coordinator. We have Connor Kirk, who is the Programs Assistant. We have Jackie Kropp, who is the Programs and Outreach Coordinator. And we have Wanda Muldrop, who is the Library Manager at the Ceiling Public Library. We are so excited to have the four of you with us. And I am going to share my screen right now so you can see their presentation and turn it over to you all. Somehow we ended up not at the beginning. There we go, so take it away. Okay, well, good morning, uh, everybody, or afternoon, wherever you may happen to be once you read this. Um, I'm Jackie Kropp, and I'm the Programs and Outreach Coordinator, as Allison said, and today we're gonna talk about how we turn all those things that don't go well into our future building blocks for success. Allison, if you wanna go ahead and switch the slide for me. Thank you. So the first part of doing this effectively, we all know that not everything is going to go the way that, they, that we plan. So some things we can develop in ourselves to make those things easier on us. Uh, the first thing is building a growth mindset. I think it's really important for us, you know, we talked about this with kids, but I think many of us as adults never really got this drilled into us when we were younger. And so we, we kind of accept this like fatalistic, oh, I, I failed, I suck, I'm the worst, blah, 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 you know, you go down that whole negative spiral of self-talk. And if that's not you, then I'm so thrilled for you. But for most of us, that's a thing. Um, you want to give yourself a free, you want to give yourself freedom and ability to, to fail because we are all going to at some point. Um, it's just the charge of how you come back from that is really what makes you um, a better librarian and a better professional. So things for you to keep in mind, um, reward yourself for efforts and action, not necessarily traits. Our traits are innate and we can't change those, but we can always control how much effort we put in and how much actions we take. Um, I also encourage you to accept opportunities that push you outside of your comfort zone because growth is not possible in a comfort zone. Uh, like Brene Brown likes to say, uh, daring greatly requires you completely jumping outside of your comfort zone. Um, also, be kind to yourself. Mistakes are an important part of this process. Um, very rarely is anything going to be catastrophically wrong if you make a mistake. I like to tell myself whenever I make a mistake, uh, is this going to matter in six months, a year, five years? And if the answer to any of those questions is no, uh, I give myself permission to uh, be a human being. Um, I also think uh, things, something else to keep in mind is that skills are not uh, born, they're built. So just because you don't know how to do something now or you haven't had a success in a certain area doesn't mean you'll never be good at that. And I think my colleagues and I can all attest, we've had to learn lots of different skills in our programming lives. And, you know, we, we practice what we preach on this one. And last but not least, when you're building your analytical toolbox, the first step to analyze a failure is to give yourself some distance. Before you go and break this back down, don't do it that day. Don't do it that week. Give yourself some time to emotionally process and feel your feelings because we all have emotional reactions to things that don't go our way. Uh, that's the first step is to give yourself a little bit of space before you uh, dive in to figure out what went wrong. Uh, Allison, if you'll change the slide, please. Thank you. Okay, so here's my best toolbox to give to you, this cr critical reflection checklist. Uh, when you're finally in that good headspace, ask yourself, and more importantly, ask others involved with a project that doesn't go well, these questions. Um, and they don't have to go in any particular order, but these answers will help you figure out how to change that initial failure into a success in the future. The first thing you need to ask is, what is out of my control? If you schedule a program on a Tuesday night and the school board decided to have an emergency meeting, that's not something you could have controlled. Uh, what can I change? Uh, and be realistic about the things that you can change. Can you change the date, the time, the people involved, et cetera? Um, what do I need that I don't currently have? I think this is probably one of the hardest questions for us to ask ourselves because we're all so used to doing as much as we can without a whole lot of infrastructure behind us. 
but it's always a good idea to be honest about what you actually need that you don't have. Um, what did I do right? I think this is a critical step. Even if something didn't go your way, you always did something that you can use to go forward. Um, and then what did I learn? So, you know, I had a program and nobody showed up. So at least there's, there's some value in the learning process from that. Either I learned that this is not a popular program or I picked the wrong day or I've got to check a certain community calendar. Or there's a certain group that always meets on that night, things like that. And then last but not least, ask yourself, has anyone I know been through a similar situation? Because I think the best learning we can get is from peer to peer, from each other. So Allison, if you'll change the slide. Um, so here, resources. You know, we're librarians, we want to give each other resources. The first one is find a network. Find people who do what you do and communicate with them. Run, bounce your ideas off of each other. The best ideas I've ever had have come from using my network and talking about ups and downs and all these things. And all the people presenting with me today have helped me refine and develop ideas that I've had. Um, so I'm really excited to, for them to share those with you as well. Um, let's also normalize the experience. I think we need to be a lot more realistic as, an, as a profession about how many times things don't go right. Because every time you go to conference, all you hear is, oh, we did this amazing thing and you can do it too if you just do this, this, and this. Well, that's not the way the world works, let's be honest. Um, I think so I think we need to be more open and discussing our failures because they're not personal foibles, it's just reality. And I think that can help us also help find that network of people who are in our same boat who've had the same problems that we have. And then last but not least, professional development. If you find yourself, you have this great idea, you want to get off the ground, but you just don't have the resources, that's what OLA is for. That's what uh, Web Junction is for. There's all kinds of resources out there for developing professional skills. You can go next. And of course, last but not least, I'll leave you with further reading. Um, if you're interested in this um, psychology of failure and how you can maximize your efforts and turn them into successes, these are four books that I think really hit the nail on the head with taking home these lessons that we talked about from a growth mindset to uh, normalizing the experience, etc. cetera. Um, my personal favorite, of course, is Dare to Lead by Brene Brown because I think she's just darn amazing. And if you're not reading her yet, you should be. And that's all for me. Okay, Wanda, are you talking about the Ceiling Book Club? I am. Okay, well, you're up. Okay. So when this was, pre was presented to what has failed, we've had a lot of good programs, we've had a lot of good attendance, and I felt like my weak spot was the adult book club. People would always say, oh, yeah, I'm going to be there. Oh, yeah, yeah, that'd be good. Let's do that. Let's do that. But then there was zero attendance. Um, I thought of my times. Uh, I started them out with 2 o'clock. I changed it to 6 p.m. I did a lot of stuff. I actually subtitled this book club dilemma into the good, the bad, and the ugly, because I really had to analyze it to see what can make it better. I told everyone, everyone who checked out a book, I said, hey, we're going to have a book club. Oh, that sounds like fun. That sounds like fun. And then I was having a book club by myself. So I had to figure out something to make it work. Now, consider that this is a very small town, um, very conservative town. If we change the name to conservative, that'd probably be just fine with the people here. And the thing is trying to get the word out, trying to get the people to come. I was having trouble with that. I had one book in particular when we went to book kits uh, that I chose. And that book was, the synopsis of it was not quite up to par to the the true introduction of what that book was about. It was a book about the lifestyle according to the unborn child. Well, it sounded kind of sweet when you started out, but it didn't end up that way. I have one lady, uh, I think she's 84 years old. She's on our local board and we all know each other. We get along great. But she came to me and said, now Wanda, 
this book is trash. It's porn. Uh, and I just, all I could think to say was, well, we don't censor. Um, and I explained to her that, you know, I'm an audio person. So if she thought reading it was a bit of a struggle, she should try listening to it. That was even more of a struggle. So um, we had to rethink, maybe look into the books just a little bit more. So still, we're running into people not coming. And I told everyone, I used Facebook to the limit on what I could do to get them here. And at this time, along about this time, we had cut back on our programming just a little bit. And I wanted the adult craft to be presented, but I didn't have a slot for it. And I got to thinking, what if I combined an adult craft or activity with the book discussion? So we tried that, Connor came up and we had a, an adult tea party. So I put most of the advertising, I would say, out on Facebook. And everyone that came in and checked out a book, I say, hey, I'm inviting you to our tea party. Well, we went from zero to, I think, that first book discussion was 10. And the people who didn't read the book, I made it clear to them. If you don't read the book, you can still come and enjoy listening and you can enjoy the tea party. So we had some discussing, some having the tea party. We were all mixed together and interacting. So I thought, huh, this might work. So that was good. So the next one, we gave it an every other month schedule. And so the next one, we, met, we had um, a book that was very popular. And uh, it went over much better. And I think we had seven at that one. We also made perfumes. So it worked. We didn't know if it was going to work. Um, my sanity was questioned just a little bit by my supervisor, I think, on even trying that. But it, it did work. Um, and we hope that to continue that, to make it better. Uh, keep in mind that this little town I'm from is only a thousand people and that's being optimistic. So you have to realize that you can't stretch people, but so far. Our youth programs were very successful. Our summer reading programs were successful. Our adult winter reading program was successful. But when it came down to people actually showing up for the program itself, that was a little testy. I, I found that the people were reading some of the books, but they had a coffee shop uh, group that I found they were discussing their books at the coffee shop. Uh, and that's a daily thing for them. So it would have been another place they'd have to go to come here and discuss another book. So, and some would turn their book in and tell me all about the book and then not come back for the program. So by combining the two, it really made a big difference. And it just had to be embellished somehow. And I think that was what started working for us. I think that's uh, just mostly all of it in a nutshell, so to speak. Okay. Well, that was really interesting. I'm going to have some questions at the end about that. So, okay. Hey, so we're on to programming for beginners. So, this is my section, and um, like Allison said, my name is Connor Kirk. Um, I'm the programs assistant at Western Plains. Um, so when I started in this position, I had always assisted with programs at the branch, the branches I worked in, but I had never actually facilitated a program. And I always thought, you know, how hard could it really be to you just go and you just throw some stuff out on a table and you just tell them what you're doing and you just do it. Well, <laughs> that's not how it went. Uh, can we get the next slide, Allison? Um, so 
one of the very first programs I did, it was actually at Kathy's branch, was wine bottle art. We did it right around Valentine's Day. And I started in January. We did this in February. And this was one of the very first programs I ever presented. And I just said, Jackie's had an instruction sheet. And I was like, okay, this is, these are the materials I'm going to need. And I'll just take it over there and we'll just do it. And so I just set out the materials. I had it ready to go. I thought this will be great. So <laughs> then the patrons start arriving and they were like, okay, we're going to decorate wine bottles. But we were doing a uh, mod pot. We were decoupaging wine bottles and they said, well, what's our theme? What, are, what guidelines do we use? What ordered steps do we go in? And I said, well, I don't know. <laughs> I said, how about I sit down with you and we'll do it all together because I hadn't tested my program. First fail. <laughs> and I didn't bring instructions because I thought Jackie told me, I was like, I got it. I got it. it it'll be great. And luckily the ladies I were, I was working with that day. I, we had about seven there and they were just the sweetest. I was so, I was like, I am so sorry. I don't know what's going on. And they were like, it's fine. It's fine. We will just work with it. We'll go. And we all had fun and we put together our wine bottles, but I, I felt like, oh my gosh, I am the program's assistant and my first program just tanked. So, but and I've talked to some of the ladies since then, and they still remember that. They were like, remember that time <laughs> we sat down and tried to make wine bottle art? <laughs> I said, oh, I do. Um, one of the next ones that was a big situation <laughs> was uh, chipboard monograms, which is where you take like a stencil and you cut out uh, a letter. So I did it with tweens and kids at Wanda's Branch. And I did them and it was, and they cut it out with scissors or X-Acto knives. And then we decorate their letter. One, when you're doing a program with kids and tweens, make sure don't bring X-Acto knives. And make sure you uh, bring a prototype. That's one of the lessons I learned from both of these make a prototype because when you tell 10 year olds we're making chipboard monograms they're just sitting there saying okay what is that and i didn't make one beforehand and bring it down so they had no idea so i was trying to explain to them what they were going to do it didn't work so we sat down and i had to sit with each kid and show each and there were 20 of them and I had to sit down and show each one and I think that program ended up, it was supposed to be about an hour long and it turned into three hours of me sitting there and kids with hot glue guns and ribbon wrapped around their hands. And it was, wow. Um, so I, yeah, I learned first and foremost, always test your program, make a prototype, bring it with them because some people as in like, I've learned that I am not, I am not a, I can't pick, visualize something. I need to see what it is that I'm going to be making. Because Jackie told me, she said, now what would you think if you came in and you sat down and you were expected to put this together? Because I, when I started this job, I was not a crafty person. I'm still not that crafty, but I've learned. You are. You're so much better than you think. <laughs> and I, but she said, imagine you sitting down, you have all these materials and you have no idea where this is supposed to end, but you need to make it look like this. And I said, well, I said, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, so I sat down and I always make a prototype now. Um, and it works a lot better because you, they can see the finished product. They can see the goal that they need to get to by the end. Um, always provide printed instructions. Some people are audio learners. Some people are visual. Some people don't want to be told step by step what the instructions are. They want to read it for themselves and work along with everybody else. 
So that helps a lot too. And it helps me remember to, oh my gosh, we forgot to add, I don't know, we forgot to add contact solution to the slime and now it's not going to turn out. So that always works. And check age appropriateness of your programs. Because if there's a chance that you could have five and six-year-olds, don't bring exacto knives. It just don't. Because I was a nervous wreck. I was like, no, I'll come over. I'll I'll do it. I'll I'll cut it for you. It's fine. Don't no. Or hot glue guns. Because then you're just a nervous wreck worrying about if they're gonna hurt themselves or not. Okay, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, also, and now I'm gonna talk about uh, summer reading program in the age of COVID-19. Um, this is a setback that we are all experiencing. I mean, it's been felt all over the world, all over our organization, it's everywhere. Um, and I was just gonna mention some of the things that we, that mainly Jackie, but we've been carrying them out uh, throughout this summer reading. It's so different than normal but we tried to get it as close to how we usually do it because it's always been a blast. And uh, the first thing that came to mind was performers. What are we gonna do when we have 100 people in a building for a performance? What are we gonna do when we're not having them in the building? Um, so our performers now, we've been doing on Zoom. We've been doing limited Zoom meetings and they can sign up for the performance. They get an emailed link to them. We've been doing uh, 16 shows a week in all in our different branches. So uh, yeah, it's been it's been great. I've gotten messages from parents that I know saying we love the programs and it's so great that we get to see because then we have some from last year and they're like, oh, the kids loved them last year. It's so great that they still get to see them. Um, and then we've also been doing, along with those, we've been doing those through Zoom, but on our Facebook pages, we've been doing our program videos. So um, every week on Wednesdays and Fridays, Jackie and I have been making videos um, with programs that we had, we had designed and written that were supposed to be carried out during summer reading. And we've been doing two a week on our theme for the week, because we've been doing uh, we broke it up the six weeks into uh, fairy tales, unicorns, mermaids, dragons, because it's imagine your story. So we've been trying to get every side of it, folk tales, mythology, um, and just get this all, make sure we cover all of our bases. Um, and that's where it goes into the weekly program packets, because in every weekly program packet, which go out, goes out to our branches, there are enough craft materials so that they, the kids can do the activity from home. And the activity that they do from home, we have made one of our program videos as a tutorial to show them how to do the program. So they can watch right along with us. We've had people post on Facebook pictures of the kids doing the craft while watching the video and they can see step by step how it goes together. I, I think it's been working really well. Yeah. It's uh, in our program packets, we do um, the craft supplies for four people. We do two sets of activity sheets like mazes and word puzzles and things like that uh, that are on theme for each week. Um, we've been doing uh, paper reading logs for those because we've been using, I forgot, Beanstack. Yeah, you forgot Beanstack. Beanstack. <laughs> um, so that's usually we do paper logs and they log minutes or challenges throughout the summer and then they bring it into the library and then they the librarian logs all their minutes for them. Well this summer we've been using Beanstack which is a digital service where it's a uh, they can log their minutes, they can log their challenges, the parents or the kids can do it at home and do it from anywhere. They have an app or their phone, they can put it on there and they can log all their time. It keeps track of everything, um, keeps track of all signups, enters them into weekly drawings, things like that. Um, 
So we have in the program packet an instruction sheet on how to get to Beanstack, mm -hmm. how to sign up, and then we have bookmarks and um, instruction sheets, printed instructions for the program, because like I said, some people like those instructions so they can see the finished product and step-by-step step what they need to do. And I think that's been working great. We've been making uh, 155 program sacks a week, which is good for 650 kids or something like that, as Jackie has learned. I am <laughs> awful with math. I am awful. That's why I have a, I majored in English. I am not a math person. I don't know how many times I've had to whip out a calculator. Oh, both of us. We've <laughs> learned that, you know, man uses tools, so calculators are your friend. Yeah, so it's, but it's been a blast. I yeah. still think it's been a lot of running around, but oh, it's been fun to film the video. chicken for sure. Yeah, but it's been fun to film the videos and see the reactions from the kids that are still getting to the videos and they're liking what they're seeing. And Well, I think to kind of tie this to what, you know, what I was talking about earlier, basically, so what we had to do was, you know, when COVID hit, we realized that we'd done all this prep work for summer reading and now it was all for naught because nothing could happen the way it did. So the first thing I did was lay out everything we do and figure out how am I going to make this digital? And, you know, from buying Beanstack to create, coming up with programming videos. And then, you know, uh, and then I had to, you know, acquire new skills. I had never made a video in my life. I'd taken selfies, but that's it. So um, I started with the thing I know best, Reader's Advisory. So I started talking about uh, doing a video once a week for um, Reader's Advisory and talking about different kinds of books that people for read for adults. And then we rolled that into summer as well. And then, you know, we took Connor's natural charm and charisma and put him in front of all the programming videos. Uh, he does such a good job at. Um, but yeah, basically, you know, we 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 stopped, we skilled, reskilled, regrouped, decided to learn some new things, and uh, decided we were going to turn this summer reading into a successful endeavor, whether or not it looked like it always had in the past. It's, I will never forget when Jackie and I had a Zoom meeting scheduled in April, and she says, "Connor, we have to redo how we can." completely redo how we do summer reading let's discuss <laughs> and, so, and her and I sat down and on over zoom and discussed this and I think I think it's worked really well yeah I'm but really proud of what we've done this is uh, I mean this is like I said this has been a setback for everybody it was definitely a setback for us for sure and we had to take a step back yep analyze the situation we had to feel our feelings and let go of them <laughs> yes very much so um but yeah, I think it's I think it's been working really well. We we're fixing to go uh, this afternoon and make more sacks. make more summer reading sacks because we send them out to our branches every week, and so they can give them out to the kids on the week of um, whichever theme we have that week. Like this week is folk tales or no, dragons. It's dragons. Oh, this week is dragons. Next we're week is folk building tales. folk tale <laughs> bags this afternoon, but I think it's been working great. Yeah. And I think that's all for me. Okay, so I think that brings it to me. I'm Kathy Ashley and I am the Public Services Coordinator for Western Plains. I've been with the system for um, a little over 18 years and during that time I've um, done a lot of different jobs and um, the one that I have well, I wear two hats right now, but that's, I took over as the manager of the Clinton Public Library 12-ish uh, years ago, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the book clubs, the issues that we've had. Um, so whenever I took over the library, there was a well-established uh, group that met once a month, and I would say it was a partial book club, partial book review but it was well attended. It was at two o'clock in the afternoon. They had coffee and snacks and it was the retired group that um, was still pretty active and so that's why the, the two o'clock in the afternoon worked really well for them. So I took over the library and um, that program promptly fell in the toilet. It did not work anymore. No one came. Um, obviously, I was gonna change some things and those people 
were kind of followers of the previous librarian who did not leave on bad terms, but they were personal friends of hers. And so they didn't trust me, the newbie. And anyway, it just died out. So I waited a couple of years and I tried again because every good library should have a book club in my mind. So I tried again and I did, um, I think we did tried an afternoon and it, after a sh the first meeting we had uh, eight people and I was so excited. And after about three months, I was down to one person. And so therefore that had to go. So I waited again and I tried a morning book club. <clears throat> no attendees at all despite like what Wanda said people saying oh yeah I'll come to that I'll come to that oh my neighbor would love that or my mom would love that no one zero so I waited again a year or two and I just I just didn't feel right about not having a book club for adults I was going I was Programming was going well in my library, and but we needed a book club. So I tried again about two years ago, and I finally found something that worked. And it is uh, called the First Monday Book Club. We meet on the first Monday night at 7 o'clock, which is after the library closes. And we've been going, we've been going about two years, and we have 6 to 12 people that attend every month. So some of the things that I did different with this last time are, I worked with our collection development coordinator, also with programs and outreach, which is Jackie, and of course the director, and we came up with a budget and a procedure for procuring enough books and digital content so that each member could have access to the book. I think that was one of the biggest things that we had, that we struggled with in the previous book club um, trials is not enough copies of the book. So now we make book kits and we purchase 12 titles, 12 copies of one title, and they're in, um, included in the kit is discussion questions. And these kits are stored in a central location and they're shared among our branches. So we just kind of check them out for the month and um, they were, they're in a bag and so everything's all together. And so it works really well. Um, we also try to make sure that we have downloadable and audio um, uh, copies of, the, of each of those books if we can get them. So that way everyone, and we even get some large print in those. So that way everybody has access to whatever type of material they prefer to read and or listen to. So, um, and, the, and the way I kind of came up with this is I polled some of our customers, our advisory board members, and uh, staff, and we came up with, they gave me all these suggestions, and so we, that's how I came up with the time of day and how many times to meet, and is it once a month, is it twice a month, is it weekly, et cetera. So <clears throat> we did once a month in the evening. So it does, um, I do have to make sure that I schedule my personal life around that kind of, but it's not been a problem. And, and I do have people that will back up if, if I need to be gone for any reason. Um, something else that was different is that we decided not to serve food. Although we do occasionally have a light snack that one of the members may say, oh, I was in the mood to make a pan of brownies and they'll bring a pan of brownies. Um, and so we, we just, we don't have food. Everybody kind of brings their a drink of water or Coke or whatever. And we meet and we meet for about an hour and it has gone amazingly well. I, I almost hate to brag on it because I don't want to jinx it. So something else that I did different was we advertised, advertised, advertised. Email, text, if, if your library customers will share their phone number, then and I remind them of meetings. And the biggest thing was is to not, not get discouraged. If you have a month or two, like especially around the holidays or in the middle of summer, there's not, not quite as many people come. Don't get discouraged. Even if you only have four, it's still um, a still book club. People are still enjoying it. 
And kind of like what Wanda said, occasionally you'll have someone that gets the book. They don't come to book club, but they bring the book back and then they want to talk about the book with whoever's working at the desk. So that's always good. Um, so let's see, go to the next slide. Um, so then I have uh, customers request programs. And I know you've all probably been through this. Oh, we need to have a sewing program or we need to have um, a program on how to teach people how to use Pinterest. So one of the programs that we did, and, we, and it went well for a while that, that parents were asking for, is a program for the moms with um, young children, stay-at-home moms that had young children not in school. And we did a craft for the moms and we had entertainment for the children and with by a staff member. And that, that was a lot of work because we had to come up with the craft, I had to make sure I had a staff member to go with the children and something for the children to do, and then something for, uh, you know, to keep the parents separated from the kids so they got a little break, and that was a lot of work. And then they enjoyed it. We never had more than three or four, and then after maybe six months or so, it kind of fizzled. Um, so it's great when, when customers request programs, but sometimes they're not always the best type of thing to do. Um, so, and another one that we've had requests for is technology and social media instruction. I know at one time Jackie spent a whole bunch of times um, making up a, um, a, a lesson plan for different types of social media instruction or technology and then no one comes. And we, we call them, we have them sign up ahead of time, we remind them, oh i forgot about that even though we called yesterday so it just those things happen you just can't get discouraged and sometimes you wait six months and try again and it will be great so don't so you don't want to get discouraged um so listen to your customers but always use some common sense bounce it off your coworkers. um and other colleagues and sometimes you'll get some really good feedback for that um <clears throat> let's see so we've had a variety of programs over the years and i could i could i could name probably 15 programs that were awesome one time we paid a lot of money for a santa claus to come and this horrible cold snap came in that day and we, I mean, we paid quite a bit of money. We had food, we had all this stuff, and about 10 people came to see Santa Claus. So when it was, it was like 14 degrees outside. It was terrible. Things just happen. You can't let external things get you down and always um, just real, you almost have to learn to, to think about what, what kind of negative things can happen and prepare your brain. And that way, if it does happen, you're not caught off guard. So, just um, keep a positive thought. So, so we've been talking, we've talked about a lot of different things today. And I think the biggest thing is, is keep trying. Uh, don't get discouraged. Talk to your colleagues for suggestions. Ask your customers for suggestions and always be ready to try again. It's fine to wait a while. Fine, or it's fine to not try again if you think it was horrible. But um, try again. Don't, don't give up and don't be too hard on yourself. And let's see, do we have any more slides or is that the last one? Yeah, so tomorrow is always a new day. And there's always a chance to try again and just try not to be too negative and too hard on yourself. If the program really did turn out bad and, and we've all had a few that just turned out bad, remind yourself that you don't have to repeat it again. You, you don't have to put yourself through it again, hopefully. Um, and, tomorrow is always a new day and try again. So I think there's one more slide. So I had a little Walt Disney saying, there's a great big beautiful tomorrow shining at the end of every day. So just keep that in mind and now we'll um, take some questions. Okay, so before I stop screen sharing, I want to leave their contact information up there. For those of you watching, if you have any follow up questions, feel free to email or call any one of these four. They could answer anything that you have. 
Uh, so some questions that I have, first off, we um, down here kind of have a debate on statistic wise, when you check out a book club book, even if someone doesn't show up for the book club, do you, but you know, like you said, they come in and they discuss it at your counter. Do you count that number towards your book club since they actually checked out the book or do they have to actually show up for the program? The CERC counts because they're all, they're all cataloged. They just have a special holdings code that says that they are a uh, part of a book kit. So right. th that CERC number counts, okay. but if they, if they do not show up to book club, then no, we do not count them in our statistics. Okay. All right. And um, Wanda, you had mentioned that you did the book club with a, when you made perfumes. How, how do you make perfumes? I'm intrigued. Okay. Well, Jackie and Connor both came to a program that the perfumes, let's see, it consisted of essential oils, right, Jackie? Um, almond oil almond oil and what was the third ingredient anyway you got to cho they got to choose different oils. Just different oils you you pick like a top bottom a top middle and base notes thank you i couldn't remember. it's been a little bit so uh, they got to choose the um which one they wanted and um uh, it's literally mixing them and to get the the uh perfume that they wanted, the one that smelled best for them. And we had little um, little vials that they got to take home. And uh, I think I still have one of those and I still use it. Uh, so you can combine, I think I combined lilac and, and sage and, and then of course your almond oil was the base. But uh, everybody had a different flavor, so to speak. And uh, well, that's fine. it turned out good. Interesting. Okay, so you guys used Beanstack this summer and we had debated using it. We kind of decided not to just because so many of our communities are so rural and they prefer in-person interaction to, you know, virtual. So how has Beanstack gone over in your more rural communities? Has, have you still seen success with it? Yes. Well, I'll start and you guys can, Kathy and Rhonda, you all can jump in. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we had a similar concern when we decided, we actually saw Beanstack at PLA and thought about purchasing it for next year. And um, we were thinking about launching it with um, winter reading this coming, like uh, winter reading 2021 at the earliest. But then COVID hit and we decided, you know what, we're just going to do this thing. So we did. Um, our concern was that we have significant areas of our counties who don't have access to broadband. Let's be honest about that. So that's why we did, ended up doing the paper logs and the sacks for the program so people who weren't able to be connected could still participate the same way that another uh, customer may be able to. But we've actually had, I'm, I'm thrilled with our Beanstack success. I, I was hoping we'd have about 200 signups and we're already past that and it's only the 22nd. So wow. I feel like uh, our customers have really responded, especially in our larger communities, Clinton and Weatherford have both had spectacular sign up and even in sealing one of our rural communities they have a good uh turnout there so what are your experiences been ladies we've had a lot of positive experiences um i i know my staff gets they get a lot of questions and about just the what do you mean we have to do it this way and we and our libraries are open um we opened about the 8th or 9th of may um, I know that it might be a little harder for other libraries that are not open because we have answered a lot of questions and we've kind of had to learn. We had a crash course in this is how to use Beanstack and the app works a little different than the actual um, the website does. And so there's been a learning curve for everybody, I think. Wanda, do you have anything to add? Yes, I have been really pleased. The last count I had, there was like 96 that had signed up. But it's not just, um, you know, they were supposed to take this and, and want to sign up at home. It was my feeling. And I found that uh, as they drifted through, it, it wasn't big groups. It was just as they were checking out books like they normally do, I would mention it again. And they go, oh, well, I don't know. 
I'm like, okay, sign me up. And so I did help sign a bunch of them up just to get them used to it. There are um, things like the kids in the summertime, they have so much other extracurricular activities like they're playing softball, they're in baseball camps, they're in cheerleading camps until sometimes uh, taking that extra time and, and getting on the computer and noting their, you know, reading logs. Uh, I haven't seen as much participation in, in that. I do remind them, but it's still not quite there, but I think considering that it's the first year, in case we decide to do this again, I think as, as long as we keep educating our patrons on this is the way we're doing it and it's a good thing that I think they'll start participating more on the the challenge, there's challenges, uh, they can earn badges, uh, do their reading logs, and also watching our performers. I just keep reminding, reminding over and over and over. And because if, if they don't, if they don't know it, they're not going to do it. You've just got to inform and get the word out. So, but I'm very pleased at, at how many we've had sign up so far. Okay. Um, so, you know, this uh, session is all about program fails and how to learn from them. So if we do get into a slump and we get discouraged and our programs aren't being successful, how do we get ourselves out of it and how do we re-engage with our patrons and our customers to reinvigorate them to come to our programs as well? I think I'll, I'll start and you guys can go ahead. For, for me, when I get discouraged and in a slump, I surround myself with people who are doing the same job and who, you know, I'll call my friends at other systems. I'll talk to, you know, I'll call Kathy up and say, hey, I just can't get excited about anything for fall. What are you thinking? What, do, you know, I have this you know, seed of an idea. Is it any good? And she's always wonderful to tell me yes or no, very honestly and directly. You need to surround, yeah, surround yourself with people who do the job and people who are going to be honest with you and who've been there before. I think that's always my best, you know. Um, yeah, that's yeah. one. Jackie showed me a group on Facebook. Oh, yeah. Um, it's about, it's like the programming librarian. Programming librarian, yeah. It has been a great group to be in because when Jackie and I are coming up with programs, mm -hmm. sometimes we do get discouraged because if we make, say, a spring set of programs, but none of them really, if they don't turn out well, you think, well, am I, do I need to re, do I need to shift the way I'm writing these programs and my ideas before we start on summer reading when we're doing four times the amount of programs? And it is really good because I can, I can walk over and ask Jackie or I can call Wanda and say, hey, what, I have this idea. What do you think about it? Which has been great. And that's the really great thing I I can call any of our branch librarians in our system mm -hmm. and I can ask them and say hey I have this crazy idea do you think it'll work in your branch and that's been really good so do any of you like do you boost your social media post or is everything you do on social media just are the interactions totally organic I think we just we've done boosting in the past for certain things, but I think as far as for our regular slated programming, this is the first year we've done a considerable Facebook ad um, buy. Uh, our marketing coordinator, Michaela, who I just like to give a shout out, is the my hero because without her, we'd be dead in the water. Um, and she does a beautiful job of editing video, <laughs> even though she'd never done one until now. So. Um, but yeah, she, we, we have been, uh, I think, a little bit, but uh, her name is Michaela Marquez. If you call that number, you can ask her questions about it because I don't have the information. Okay. Um, so how do you measure, measure success in your programs? I think customer feedback is um, during the program, after the program. Um, I have the privilege of going to different um, social events as far as speaking for the library, different um, 
clubs and etc and I hear things around town I know Wanda probably does too uh, I hear things around town oh I can't believe you all had 150 kids in the library to see Santa Claus that was awesome I'm so glad you did that or I'm so you know or I'll hear from some of the teachers oh thank you so much you know for inviting our pre-k to the library and um, and then those parents maybe I'll hear back from them or we'll see comments on our Facebook page that you know thank you so much for doing these things and I would say I get the most just out and about in the public you know even I'll hear comments in the grocery store or whatever um, or people asking uh, I'll be, I have more than once sat at a volleyball game my, my daughter plays and someone will say oh my gosh we have two hours I need something to read put this on my phone and they'll hand me their phone and I you know get them set up with overdrive right quick so you know I just I hear things out in the public and I think sometimes I think we get so caught up in the numbers mm -hmm. and we need to have 25 people we need to have 20 people here we we're just what we're expecting this is what we need and you know some of my sometimes some of the best programs I've done have been with four or five people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I think sometimes like yeah we get so caught up in the amount of people we have and the stats of it all but like when you get feedback from the teens in the program for example mm -hmm and they have thoroughly enjoyed it and maybe they've come out of their shell maybe you've known them for a while and this i think that sometimes we just need to focus on what they're getting out of it and quality yeah quality. quality yeah i think that's a huge thing i know i forget about it sometimes because i i think oh well i only had three people show up to this but i had a great time with those three people we had great discussions, recommend some new books to them. They to, to recommend new books to me. I, I think sometimes we just need to remember. But it's not always about the number. It's about the people, too. I, That's uh, very true. I have um, one thing that I called the, the book club dilemma of success was that by the end of the day on both of the programs, the people who came just for the crafts, I had two, three, and four people check out a book for the next time. To me, that made it a success. That's what you were trying to do. And they had really no interest in the book discussion. But once they listened, I, I think they kind of felt like they, if they came, they were on the spot to speak. And, and when they found out just how relaxed it was, um, I think it made everybody relaxed and they were able to just go with the flow. And I think they really uh, showed that it was successful by having the desire to be part of the discussion next time. I also want to give a, a heads up to Connor. One thing we do on our programs is uh, we have a very good relationship with our school. And even though I uh, do a lot of verbal communication, because I like to talk, and we have a, 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 just a good rapport with most of our patrons that come in, uh, the ones that maybe I don't know well, my assistant Julie knows, and we just pick up the slack with each other on visiting with people. But one thing I would do was every time we had a kids program, I would just call the secretary at school and say, please announce that we're having a, a program. And they would. And it got to where the kids just love to see Connor so much. I would say, would you please announce we're having crafts with Connor? And they actually announced that in the whole school. <laughs> and um, I, I just, uh, he just, uh, the kids love him. And um, he's just very, very good with them. And, um, they would actually announce it the way that I asked them to. And so small town's not so bad sometimes. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's quite pleasurable sometimes to, to uh, just know that you can depend on somebody to, to go to bat for you when you need to. So. Well, it's, I That's think to true. Wanda's point, you know, what, how I define success, it's about relationships. If people come in and they come, have a good experience and walk away with a positive feeling about the library, that is, that is successful. 
our job is to make do good things for people. And if we do it, it doesn't matter if there were three or 30. Um, that's how I look at it. That's very true. Okay, well, thank you all so much. Um, before we wrap this up, do any of you have any final statements or just words of wisdom that you've just thought of as we were doing this? No pressure. Well, I would say that this is, it's just a very enjoyable job. I, I love people. I like to work with people. Um, the small town atmosphere is, um, it's just very inviting. Um, it, when you know everyone's name that comes in the door and, 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 you know, a lot of times we have people, we're on a main road to Denver here. So a lot of times we have people that just pop in that they need a computer or they need a fax. And, you know, by the time they leave, we know them too. And uh, they say, I'm coming back. What are your hours? You know, and, and, uh, and they're so thankful and appreciative of the small town service that they get. So uh, it makes us want to help them when they're very appreciative of it. So That's very true. Anybody else have any final thoughts? Well, I think you guys have all given us a lot to think about and a lot of positive advice. And so again, I want to thank you all so much. Thanks to all of you for joining us. If you enjoyed this, please consider joining the Public Library Division of OLA. We do this kind of stuff monthly. We meet and we discuss different things every month, all pertaining to public libraries. And please remember to fill out your conference evaluations. So I hope to see you for some more Public Libra Library Division sessions.